I'm going to call this meeting of Gloucester School Committee to order. Um, I will uh, remind everybody that the mission of Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. And I will ask you to join me in the salute to the flag. Just a second, here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, the first order of business um, is, uh, okay. I got the wrong agenda in front of me. So let me just get the right agenda up. The first order of business is oral communications. If there's anybody here who would like to address the school committee on any um, subject other than what's on the agenda, um, you um, can do that by um, raising your hand um, and I will uh, recognize you. Um, if you are dialing in on a phone call, um, you have to press star nine. I'll also remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded. Um, um, okay. I don't see anyone um, wishing to speak. Okay, so we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, um, <clears throat> which is um, recognitions. Um, are there any recognitions? Kathy? Um, I just want to reiterate, I know we've acknowledged the efforts of the teachers and all the staff and the administration in previous meetings, but they continue to do um, outstanding effort in terms of getting our kids back on a schedule. I know there are many kids that were delighted to have some routine uh, some academic challenge and some work to be done. Um, and I, as well as both seeing their teachers and, and classmates online. So, um, you know, I, I commend them for doing everything they can and continuing to try to improve how we deliver instruction in this remote day. That's it. Thanks. Samantha. Um, I just was able to listen to a presentation from Mike Hale um, from the DPW during the BNF meeting, and I just want to recognize the really incredible work that's being done um, at O'Malley by the DPW. It sounds like it's pretty extensive. I can't wait to see it. Um, I know that it's long overdue, and the teachers and the students alike are going to um, appreciate it when they come back home. So thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I would, I would just like to um, uh, reiterate what Kathy said about the teachers, as well as I'd like to point out that our nurses um, have been um, right from the get-go in this situation, been volunteering to work with the um, health department of the city doing follow-up and um, um, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what they call it when they, they make all the calls to uh, see who's been exposed to um, somebody who's might have been exposed. Um, the contact which, tracking. Contact tracking. Um, and they've been doing that um, and they jumped right in um, without uh, any real prodding. So I'd like to uh, particularly um, 
point out um, that our nurses are, are doing an outstanding job. And I'd also like to talk uh, about our food service workers who um, are providing um, daily lunches and breakfasts uh, for um, almost 400 students. Um, and uh, so, and everybody else, but uh, I'd like to point out those two. Okay. Anybody, anybody else, any other recognitions? Um, we will move on to, uh, I don't believe we have a student advisory council here tonight, um, the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda that anyone would like removed for further discussion? Melissa. So I didn't see anything on the warrants. Is it, was it meant to be what came out of BNF earlier? Um, I didn't see anything either. Um, our BNF meeting got cut short um, yeah. and because, uh, and I don't, we never got to um, the warrant. Um, so did you B, sign a warrant? This? Kathy, did you sign a warrant this week? Yes, I did last Thursday, I did. Okay, so um, I know I saw it. Um, um, when Stephanie sent out, um, the agenda. There were there were some um, other documents, and I. So I'm um, I'm looking at it. DNF minutes and program. It's not. It's not the warrant. Yeah. I mean, I'm okay voting on it if Kathy reviewed it, but just saying it didn't get circulated. Okay. I reviewed it very carefully. Is there anything outstanding that you noticed? No, really very, you know, regular expenses. Okay, so uh, we- And then the transfers and referrals are on the agenda. Do we have anything under those categories? There's a transfer that we're gonna be, that's gonna come out of um, uh, BNF that we're gonna vote on separately um, tonight. But um, the rest of the transfers, oh. hmm? do you want to, uh, Gary, could, Gary could explain what the other transfers were if you'd like. Sure. Well, we just, is, is it, was it part of the BNF packet? Is that what you're, yes. is that what's in this? Okay, now is there any referral? No, not that I know of. Okay, so it's the consent agenda minus D that we approved. Okay. So I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda without the referrals. Okay. Second, anyone? Second. Okay. Um, Maria, uh, roll call vote. Joel. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Samantha. Yes. Laura? Yes. Kathy? Yes. I don't think the mayor's here, right? I don't see her. I don't see her. Okay. He was trying to get in. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda um, is uh, a presentation from Doran Whittier. Um, on the updated uh, um, process, um, progress and design at the East Gloucester Veterans um, Elementary School. Um, so I'm going to turn this over um, to Michelle Rogers. Is this the same one that was to the council last night? It is. Yes. So if you if you had seen the one to the council last night, this will look very familiar. Um, I think most of you were there, so I. I will go through a little bit quicker uh, tonight and then we can have some time for any questions that you might have, if that's appropriate. Um, it's a little hard to hear you, Michelle. Oops. Is that any better? Yeah, yes. pull the mic up. To, okay. All right. I'm going to switch over to my screen. And I'm going to ask if everybody can see the, see the screen and my cursor. 
It has not updated yet. I, I am not seeing your screen, Michelle. Uh, Give me one second. Okay. Did I have to wait for your for your approval? You should be able to do it. Let me make one other chat setting share. We already did this. So yep. where are you? Um, we have, have a solution. There you go. I'll make you co-host. You should be able to present now. Can you see this now? Not yet. Nope. Are you selecting? Are you selecting your entire screen or just the uh, screen two? Okay. No, nothing, nothing prevents you from doing that. Let me see if I move it to screen one. Sorry. It looks like oh, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you can't do the second screen. You can only use the primary screen. Oh, okay. Earlier it was working with the second. All right, let's... Oh, but now you're gonna see it in presentation mode. Um... Oh, that's okay. Will that work for everybody if we just keep moving forward? Can you see this in presentation mode? Or do I need to change this? This looks okay. I can help it a bit. There you go. I'm not hearing it very clear. Okay. How about now? Better. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Looks good. All right. From the beginning. Um, so tonight we're we're just we're going to walk you through the schedule, the site, the exterior building design update, and interior design um, update. And so one of the first things that we want to talk about is, despite COVID nineteen, we have managed to stay on schedule and our uh, consultants have managed to stay on schedule as well. So our goal is to be presenting our uh, cost estimates for uh, schematic design to our estimators on April 29th. That is the entire package of uh, drawings and specifications will go out to both uh, our consultant as well as the OPM and they will get an independent cost estimate. Uh, when those come back, we'll have a chance to review them and then we have a reconciliation and then we come back to the committee, the school building committee with the cost estimates. All of that um, gets put into the package and the delivery date to the MSBA is on target for uh, July 8th. So we're maintaining our target dates. The MSBA is on schedule to date as far as we know as well. With our site plan update, the last time we presented to you uh, about well, about six weeks ago or so, our site, we had developed our site and our site circulation plan. And since then we had gone to speak to the um, AHJs, the authorities having jurisdiction, which is fire and police, as well as the DPW. And we spoke a lot about how traffic works on the site, how cars come in and circulate around, how uh, fire trucks would enter the site and circulate around the building. And then we talked about overflow parking, for special events and we talked about snow storage and how to remove snow from the site. When we spoke about the site originally, we talked about having play fields in the back of the site. We also talked about uh, play areas that were for the older students in the back of the site, some outdoor learning spaces, playful hardscape play areas, a small kindergarten uh, play area out front of the building, and then our bus uh, circle being uh, doing double duty as also hardscape play area. And since that time, we've progressed with our site. Um, we've taken into account some of the recommendations of the police and fire. We've made our emergency access lane wider all the way around, all the way here. We've accommodated for overflow parking along the back loop, as well as along the emergency access drive. We've taken into account the, the um, 
recommendation to reduce retaining walls and therefore reducing costs. So in doing so, the site is now, the, we've removed the entire retaining walls along this area here, which had an effect on the parking out front, which I'll get to in a moment. And then we took the recommendation of traffic to provide a separate turning lane into the site to pull cars off of Webster Street uh, quicker. Oops, sorry. So zeroing in on the back part of the site, we've incorporated a half basketball court back here. We've accommodated for, in addition to the bus, uh, the queuing loop that will come around this area in the afternoon, we can accommodate 16 parking spaces for overflow parking, as well as still get an emergency vehicle past all of those and up along the building side. We've uh, kept the turf field, added some swing sets back here, and provided fencing and gating around the perimeter of the whole play area. And then in the front of the building, we've increased the width of this access drive to uh, accommodate 14 overflow parking spaces and still provide access for emergency vehicles. We've tested the turning radius for both buses and fire trucks, as well as the access um, slope and radius in, and turning into the site. And when I talked about the removal of this retaining wall, we had to change the direction of the parking spaces along Webster Street. So they're now parallel. That reduced those parking spaces from 10 parking spaces to six, but overall we were still able to accommodate 120 parking spaces on the site. At the front of the building, we've uh, brought into our design the theme of having a, a pier, a dock, and then some piers that pull out into the landscape with some uh, over, um, I'm sorry, bioretention drainage will be accommodated underneath this area here. And then these areas within this area, uh, the pavers here will be used for outdoor classrooms and seating areas. So you can accommodate uh, seating spaces here for teaching, some art classes or gathering. Uh, if the flagpole is out here, you can have a, an all school gathering out in this area as well. Also when the buses are dropping off, they'll be entering over here, but students could enter under a cover to the main entrance and students and, and pedestrians walking from the parking area will come in this area here to the main entrance. As far as the exterior design, we've brought, we've done a lot of work on the exterior design to uh, make the building more cohesive, uh, tying both the uh, public spaces in with the academic areas. So those of you who, who remember the design, the cafeteria is on the lower right-hand side, the gymnasium on the second floor above, the art room, and media center uh, is over the administration area. And then to the left of the building, we have our academic courts with kindergarten on the, on the ground level. And in between those spaces, we have special education spaces, extended learning spaces, office spaces within uh, the area in the middle of the building. This is the front elevation of the building. Again, the main entrance, cafeteria, gymnasium, media and art. As we move around to the back portions of the building, this is facing out towards the playground, so your extended learning spaces are in the center of the building, flanked by uh, academic classrooms and teaching spaces. And on the lower side here, you see the media center and the art on the second floor with the administration overlooking the bus loop and the front entrance. And on this side, the cafeteria with its entrance for parent drop-off underneath the canopy and the gymnasium above that. We've moved our, our design forward and started doing rendering so that we can begin to get a look and feel for the overall size of the building as well as the landscape. So what you see here is uh, as you're coming up Webster Street, this would be the turn aisle going into the parking area. The uh, front courtyard space and gathering area, again, the gymnasium on the second floor with the cafeteria below. And you can see beyond the bus turnaround loop. 
As you move further up Webster Street, you're about at the middle of the building overlooking the bus loop. And then about, this is about the intersection of Friend Street looking back down towards the building. And you can see the retaining walls in the beginning of the uh, emergency access drive with the kindergarten play space in front and the uh, art and media and uh, main entrance beyond. The interior design side, we've brought the design forward using our, following our, our parties for warm uh, wood structures within the space and playful seating areas that you see integrated within the structure. Or we're looking to bring art um, into, the, into the space and connecting the main entrance to the cafeteria and uh, connecting both horizontally and vertically with the media center and the gymnasium on the second floor. On the second floor, you would come up the stairs and again, you have the vertical connection with the main entrance. You have the media center entry on the left-hand side, again, incorporating those playful uh, porthole windows. Beyond those are seating within the library space for children to, to gather either one or two students um, and sit uh, quietly by themselves or in small group areas. The railing system will be made of uh, wood railing at the top with integral um, metal mesh. And again, we have our post and beam structures tying the structure all the way through, connecting uh, both the media center all the way through into the lobby. In the cafeteria, which is uh, right off the main entrance lobby, we have this connection to the entryway. Again, the porthole windows and the ceiling, which is mimicking a sunburst here, uh, has been designed so that it has an acoustical feature so that you can both visually and acoustically separate some of these spaces. And then beyond that, within the cafeteria, we have uh, acoustically separated space for students who, can, who need a quiet lunch space. So they can, this is all glass so that they can be visually monitored by uh, cafeteria staff, but they're still acoustically separated. The finishes within this space, the, you can see the higher tile walls, which are great for maintenance as well as longevity and uh, easier to clean. In the classrooms, or both our kindergarten classroom as well as our general classrooms, are, the spaces are generally the same with the exception that the kindergarten classrooms are uh, larger than general classrooms and have a uh, bathroom, a single user bathroom within that space. But you can see here that cubbies are built in with storage above for teachers, mail slots for the students. You have multiple teaching zones within this space. So you have a teaching zone with projectors on one wall, writable surface and folding wall on the other side. And this wall would fold, fold back and connect two classrooms together. You have different zones towards the back of the space as well as towards the front. And then adjacent to the kindergarten or between all classrooms is the um, the small group room, which will be used for uh, push in uh, space for special education. Within uh, both classrooms, we have a special feature for a uh, built in seating area. This is for students to go and sit either by themselves or with one other students. This is for uh, students who need to separate at some point and still be observed or they could choose to go and work separately at the window space. If you remember, we had in our last presentation uh, spoken about the moving the auditorium to the second floor, so it's now part of the gymnasium, and that's reflected in this design here. So here you have the stage, and as part of that, we've in, enlarged the gymnasium so that you can have some spectator seating within this space. The gymnasium is large enough to have two uh, classrooms going on at the same time, if it's divided, or a full court for basketball. And you can see this is this gymnasium here down in the photo has a similar situation where they have the stage as part of the gymnasium. And then finally, our media center. Um, again, flexibility being uh, part of our theme here. 
the furniture will be flexible so that you can arrange it in smaller groups or larger groups for different size classrooms. You have multiple teaching spaces here. You have, uh, it's, it is visually and um, physically connected to the art room through an overhead door so that the door opens up and you can have a maker space outside the art room and have that kind of connection between art and media center. And then within the space, we have different seating spaces. You can see along the windows here in the background, you have that same kind of curb space so children can uh, either grab a book and go sit within their little space by themselves or with a, a buddy. They, they would be large enough for one or two students to sit together. And so that's the end of our presentation and it brings everything that we've done to date up, up to date for you. Do you have any questions? Um, questions, uh, Laura. Um, thank you for that, Michelle. Um, two initial questions. Um, what's, how are children who are unable to climb the stairs uh, moving around this building? We, we do have an elevator within the building. Okay, one elevator? One elevator, it's within the, um, it's borders between the academic area and the, um, and the public space. So it would always be always accessible for anybody who wanted to get to that floor level within the public space. Okay, and just my second question, just looking at the, the view from Webster Street uh, onto the campus, um, just seems like the school is very exposed. You know, it's not, uh, just thinking about West Parish where you sort of have to go down a long road and the school is not, I'm just wondering about that from a safety perspective. Is that, is that how schools are still being designed at the moment? Yeah, we, we don't have the luxury of having a larger site um, here, but we, we do find that uh, exposure isn't a bad thing. You can see who comes onto your site immediately. You can monitor having the administration uh, space overlooking both the entrance and the parking area as well as that um, breadth of Webster Street, you can monitor who's coming onto the site um, fairly easily. Okay, thank you. Melissa? Thank you. Uh, Michelle, you mentioned that you had to take out a couple of parking spots, and I thought you said that you got down to 124 uh, bases for this design. Our goal, our goal has been 120. 120? Yep, and we have managed to keep 120 uh, spaces on site. So, and that means that there's enough parking for staff and is there extra? Yes, so your full-time equivalent staff is about 80. And we, we use a two point, uh, I'm sorry, a 1.5 ratio to staff. Uh, the ratios don't mean anything to me because we heard that at West Parish. I just want to make yep. sure that there's enough parking for staff and then some visitors yes. during the day. Yes. There is. What I'm hoping to hear, I should say. Yes. Okay, excellent. And then my second question um, is, I noticed the colors, are, is the intent to keep it different colors of brick and maybe some grays on the out exterior? So we haven't chosen the exact color of the brick. We do know it's going to be a brick. It's going to be in a, uh, deeper red tones and the grays, um, we're looking at the different color for the metals. So either there'll be lighter grays or darker grays. We haven't chosen those, but the rendering is sort of, is beginning to help us make those kinds of decisions. Okay. Thank you so much. Samantha? Could you, thank you for the presentation. Um, could you sort of explain what the purpose of the kindergarten play space is? Is it just an extension of their sort of school day to get outside, or is that meant to be used um, for their recess instead of the larger play space? So typically we, we have kindergarten children qualify for a smaller um, play structures. So- I'm sorry to interrupt it. You can't be heard. No one can hear her. I'm getting all these emails. I can't hear you. It looks like you're muffling and we have to like, sit on the, you have to kind of have to speak loud. I don't want to be rude, but then they're going to say, this is no good presentation because we're going to hear you. Thank you. Is this any better? I'm holding the mic right up to my mouth. Yes. Is everybody muted? Yeah, I be muted just to let her know, and I am muted now, just to let her know that she couldn't be heard. And I was getting text saying I can't hear her. Thank you. I appreciate that. 
No, I agree. I was just trying to see if other people were unmuted and maybe that was why. I'll, I'll try to speak louder. Um, so yes, kindergarten, uh, we typically do a special size uh, playground for kindergarten students. Uh, their equipment is, is typically smaller than, uh, large, from, than the fifth grade students or older students. Mm -hmm. So it's not so, that they can't play on the back ones, it's just that uh, they have their own dedicated space as well. Yeah, I guess it just seems fairly small without a lot mm -hmm. of running space. So I wouldn't want to see that be sort of in lieu of the larger outdoor space. They also have the full bus loop as part of their uh, play area as well. So they can okay. take out their little bicycles or tricycles okay. and, and um, have that bus loop, which will also have hopscotch on it and those kinds of events. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And then my other question is, you said that there's sort of quite a bit of wood interior. Um, mm -hmm. What is the maintenance like for that? Actually, so we've um, tried to address this a couple of times. Wood is actually fairly easy to maintain. It, uh, the columns and beams there, I think you've seen over at uh, West Parish, you put the um, varnish on them or the sickens on them, to, whether they're inside or outside, and then you can leave them alone for about 10 years. Uh, you, you have to stick to that uh, regimen, but it's no different, or actually it's less than what would be required if you were painting uh, gypsum wallboard or um, you know, less expensive than if you were doing tile, uh, a tile wrap around them. I guess, so I heard you say that there's gonna be wood railings uh, the top of the railing is wood. Okay. Just just the top finish. The rest of it would be uh, e either a metal or a mesh. Okay. Rich. Rich. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we heard from the DPW just before we had this meeting and uh, they painted a picture of maintenance of the wood posts, particularly outside as being, um, I think I can characterize it as exceptionally extensive involving sanding and days worth of work. Um, and you know, that's, that would be a legitimate concern, obviously. Can, can you speak to that? I cannot. That's the first that we've heard of them having to do that kind of work on those posts. So then, are they speaking uh, specifically about West Parish, or are they speaking yes, about yes. posts in general? So then, um, well, West Parish, you've uh, you've built other buildings, I mm -hmm. presume, with similar kinds of columns on the outside and on the inside. Mm -hmm. And what is, uh, from your vantage point, what's the track record? We've actually had we've had a very good track record uh, with the kind of finish that we place on the outside, which was similar to what we had done at West Parish, which is. Uh, it's like a marine quality finish on the outside for the wood and the maintenance is quite low if it uh the first i believe that after the first year you have to redo it one more time because it sinks in to the fresh wood but then after that it should stick for a few years so no more difficult we haven't found it to be any more difficult than other maintenance around any building I, i'd be happy to have a conversation with mike Hale or, or joe Vecito about that joe yeah, just to, to piggyback, um, the, the wood columns at West Parish are being refinished um, my, upon the recommendation from Brad Dorr last when he was touring the building. He mentioned those are due for refinishing, and Mike Hale was just in the last meeting talking about how West Parish's maintenance costs are, or maintenance task list is, you know, bigger than any of the other schools we have, and um, seemingly that some of it was for good reason and some of it was you know um could have been avoided if different finished materials had been chosen um so i guess that would just be you know my hope is that um these considerations i know you mentioned joe lucido is on the building committee and that joe lucido hopefully understands the maintenance consequences of decisions that are being made so i hope that um that's being taken into account and that the wood finish as you said you know, I know West Paris is a lot of tile on the walls and that was explained to um, me and others that that was um, a little more expensive up front but cheaper in the long run because kids can't kick them in and they require less painting etc cetera, etc cetera. and so I'd hope that if we have wood finishes on the interior there's the same justification that in fact to be painting less should be repairing you know 
fewer holes or you know, wh whatever those reasons are to justify what the offset may seem like um, a more um, high grade or high maintenance finish. Uh, I have other questions, Jonathan, if I can keep going or do you one at a time? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the, the play field you have out back, what are the dimensions on that play field? Um, I believe they are 60 by 90. Okay. So just, just for this, this committee's, I did a quick look up. An indoor basketball court is 94 feet by 50 feet. A football field is 360 by 160. A soccer field is 360 by 225. So this is a very small, this is, God, smaller than a house lot in like the most dense area. It's about the same size as the gymnasium. The gymnasium, you said, holds a full size basketball court, right? The gymnasium is uh, 6,000 square feet. So this is a little bit, a little bit less than that. So just that's just a consideration that the, the school committee should be aware of that this, you know, this will be the smallest play field at any of our schools and it'll be notably smaller. Um, my second question coming from BNF, uh, Mike also mentioned that because of the site design, there's no snow storage space, which means we will not be able to plow snow, let the snow blow snow into a truck and have it all left site. And Mike Hale said this was going to be twice as expensive as normal plowing forever. And so I'm wondering if, if we return to um, some of these retaining walls, if again, more expensive up front to build an additional space where there would be some um, snow storage capacity, if in the long run, if over the next 50 years, we're not paying twice the snow removal cost, do we make that money back? And is that something we can still look at at this point? Um, you know, try and get it right up front. I, I, know I don't want to speak for- You can't build stuff without snow storage space in any other sector of the city. So it's kind of funny that the city yeah. itself would build something without it. I don't want to speak for, for Mike or Joe, but uh, we did have, we did review the site plan with them and we found, uh, I believe that their opinion is that not having the retaining walls is helpful because they get to blow the snow up, up into the grassed areas. So in that bus loop, they won't have to lift it up over retaining wall. They can blow the snow up in that area. Okay, well, that was, that's the opposite of what was reported just an hour ago. So, so I guess I would just like that to be circled back because if it is in fact going to all have to be hauled off and because for whatever reason not blown onto the, the grass, I'd like to just see if there's a way to solve that problem, you know, early in the process rather than decades of increased cost. Um, another question I had was related to the outdoor classroom. I know that both the East Gloucester and the veterans principal are on the building committee. Um, I'm curious whether that will ever actually get used for what it's being described that it could be used for. I think it looks great. I think the, the premise behind how you could use it um, is, is interesting, but I don't know that programmatically we would ever see an elementary school class outside in that outdoor classroom, taking advantage of it um, in the way it should be. And so I'm wondering if, if either of them have chimed in during the building committee meetings and opine that yes, if that is built, it will get used or, or you know, or not. Rich, do you want to address what the principals have stated about the outdoor classrooms? So Joel, your position is if, if we build it, they will not come. No, I'm wondering if they uh, will. The principal's point of view is, is diametrically opposite of that. Um, the whole business about building a, a lead environmentally sound and uh, educational environment for the school is part of the educational process. And I think that both principals have been quite enthusiastic about uh, making the assertion that they want to see that used um, so that you know, kids have an opportunity not only to work inside, but to go to be outside, to do science, and uh, just learn a little bit more about their environment. Um, so I've only heard a genuine enthusiasm from the principals in this regard. Well, that, that's, that's great. Um, and if it will be used, then it, you know, probably makes sense to include it. I just didn't understand. Um, again, one of the, the programmatic things that I don't quite know how to reconcile, we're about to spend 
you know, $1.7 million in safety upgrades at the O'Malley Middle School and the high school. Right now, the veterans teachers are told they're not allowed to even open their doors to the outside when it's hot out um, for safety reasons, but yet they will be allowed to take their students completely out of the classroom and put them down in an outdoor classroom in plain sight of Webster Street. You know, it just seems confusing to me how they'll be allowed to do that if they can't even open a door right now. But you want to take a stab at that? We're armoring two schools and then putting an outdoor classroom at a third school. Those, those, those seem, again, I'm not necessarily against having an outdoor classroom, but it just seems like we're heading in two different directions as a community with the signals we're giving as to how we're keeping our students safe or how we prefer our students to be educated. Right. Uh, Michelle, if I can uh, ask you a question which may help to respond uh, to Joel's comments. Uh, all schools um, today obviously have to have built-in security systems. Will the outdoor classroom uh, be in a situation and a location whereby um, they are in a relatively safe zone because access into the building uh, is, you know, through certain areas. Now, in the most, you know, I mean, somebody parachuting in or, or taking pot shots from up on the hill or something along those lines, I mean, is that the basis for which we make our decisions? Or do we um, create the strongest, most secure circumstances that we can within reason and also provide students with opportunity at the same time. So my question again, uh, after bloviating, is uh, will the classroom be in a situation um, where you know, it, it's not necessarily open and vulnerable, uh, but is, is protected by the security measures that the school will have? The outdoor classrooms are located adjacent to outdoor play spaces, so you're your classrooms are, are in the same areas of, as your play spaces. And I don't think we're gonna stop outdoor play. We're gonna keep that happening. I believe that one of the reasons why you don't want the doors open is because you don't want people to inadvertently come into the building. You wanna keep your building secure. Uh, around the site, you have fencing around, around all the play areas, fencing around all the, the entire site. And so your children are within the fenced areas. Uh, they're safe as far as that goes, but I, I, I mean, can't, I can't really address thought, the rest of the questions because, I mean, I thought the peer is, outside. I thought the peer design that was being highlighted, and that's where the outdoor classroom area is, right, where, the, where you showed the, the dock architecture and the, the, the peer. There is, there is an outdoor gathering classroom there, and there's right. also... Isn't that in front of the front door? It is, yeah. There's also... You know how all visitors to that school will be passing right past that outdoor classroom to get to the front door during the school day? If you have visitors coming when the, when the students might be out there, yes. And we also were planning to have an outdoor classroom in the back uh, near the swing sets as well. And again, I admit I'm not the expert here as to what the best placement is, but it just seems funny to me they're about to armor the front entrances for the high school and the middle school and then put an outdoor classroom in front of the front door of this new elementary school. It, and it's adjacent to the bus loop where the students will also be having recess as well. So it, it, the outdoor classrooms and the outdoor play spaces are adjacent to each other. Kathy, last question. Kathy? Uh, I, I guess I just want to point out, I think all of our school gardens, or at least some of our school gardens, are, happen to be situated in front of the schools. West Parish is closer to the road. East Gloucester is right in the front of the school. Um, so from a, um, I guess, utilizing the space of our sites, you know, sometimes they're out in front. Same with O'Malley. O'Malley's right in the courtyard, and they do learning outside. Um, the, so the veterans is there as well. Yeah, so anyway, I just wanted to point that out because um, I'm not an expert either on, on the topic. Um, my question has to do with the, the wooden railings inside. And I know as a building committee and, and when we did the visioning and, and the look and feel for the inside, we talked a lot about warmth. Um, but I also know at West Parish for the railings themselves, for the stair railings, we picked, I believe, a stainless steel mm -hmm. because of a maintenance 
right? They didn't need to be painted. They didn't need to be varnished. They didn't need to be anything. So the railing's still going to be a metal, but the wood is a more decorative cap. The, the wood would be the cap part of it, and the rest of the railing uh, and the guardrail piece would be on the handrails where the students are actually touching are all the stainless steels or okay. the metals. Great, thanks. Bar. Thank you. Um, just a question on what looked to me like a sort of glass, a high glass front and back of that first sort of center uh, entrance space. Am I correct there? Uh, the the wall that's mostly glass in the back, or are you? I I thought there was one also above the um, close to the entrance to the school and in the back. Is that? Uh, I don't have it. I can't see it in front of me. But yeah, I'm, can I share my screen again, Grant? Sure. Yes, you should be able to. Can you see that screen? No. Try it again. Try it again. No. Nope. Let's try one more time. Uh, and Michelle, please make sure you're loud enough. Sorry. Yes, sorry. I'm sorry. Can you see this now? Yep. Okay. Are you talking about in the front or at the rear of the building? Oh, it must be in the rear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this this is the extended learning areas. So they have uh, views of the backyard from this extended learning space. Which so that's three floors of classrooms there. Yes. Yeah, so each each area here would be a, a floor of classrooms. So your kindergarten and your first grade share this extended learning. The second and third graders uh, share this extended learning, and the fourth and fifth graders share this extended learning. Okay, so what I was curious about um, related to that was two things, both cleaning and maintenance, which may be obvious, um, but also sort of um, climate control issues. Sun, you know, I'm sure you know the orientation there, but I'm just wondering how that impacts temperature in those in those spaces. Yeah, so, so first, all the glass is tuned uh, to, to uh, orientate for the sun. So we we actually work with a, a glass tuner to make sure the coloring of the glass is correct so that we don't get the heat um, and the hot spots within the glass. And then uh, as far as uh, air conditioning and heating inside the building, all of that, uh, we work with uh, very closely with our uh, consultants to make sure that we don't have the cold spots up against glass. And then related to maintenance and cleaning of that? Mm -hmm. So um, it's similar. To, so. At the West Parish School, we have a similar condition where we have a three-story, a couple of three-story areas where we have glass. So you would have the same kind of uh, cleaning uh, program that you have over at West Parish for, for their stair towers and uh, where we have the full glazing there. Okay. I can check with Michaela on that. Okay. Thank you. Samantha? <clears throat> Could you, now that we're back on the presentation, go back to the outdoor space in the back, please? This one back here? That shows the fencing. You had one that showed. The fencing um, yeah. and the gates. So if there was an emergency, where mm -hmm. are students and staff going to congregate? I'm not, we haven't done the emergency plan yet. That's something that you work out with the principals and with the um, police and fire departments. So I'm just, it's horrible to think like this, but I'm just curious, will there be gates for somebody to be able to, to like if they needed to get out? Because I'm imagining retaining walls and then fencing and not really an exit from the back if necessary. And if there was not an ability to get to the front because of an emergency, is there a way to get out from the back? So we don't have retaining walls back here. So okay. The, the natural slope of the land is, is as it's existing right now. And right now you have fencing along the property line out back here. You know, beyond this is the highway. So there's fencing yep. along there. And then there's a property up above that. And then uh, the fencing goes beyond that. So what we, we did is we just brought the fencing closer to the play space. 
Okay. So I guess my question is still, is there a way for people to exit out the back to Webster Street? So Webster Street sort of wraps around, right? If I'm looking at this correctly. Web, this is Webster Street? Yep. And then it goes, is there, are there houses? I guess I, I've, I'm just Maybe, where, where are they supposed to be going? We talk about the gates, Michelle, about the, how the gates operate. Well, I was just wondering, you're concerned about people leaving the site, and I, I, don't think there's, I don't think the intention is for students to leave the site in the event of emergency. So I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there's the entrance and the exit. If for some reason this is, the front of this is blocked off due to an emergency, is there a way for kids to get up and out onto Webster Street if they cannot get out the front. That's what I'm wondering about. So if they were to exit here, there's there's a gate here and they okay. would, you know, get beyond that gate and, you know, I suppose we could add another gate back in here, but they would end up climbing a hill. Okay. I I, I think the emergency exit plans would are something that uh, the police and the fire have to to work out with the principals. Okay. Yeah, I can wait for that. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? I can't see everybody right now with this view. With um, uh, yeah, just to follow. Um, so that that safety evacuation plan is that is police and fire going to be consulted before this design is further locked in to make sure that they see a workable path or did you kind of just do we just give them the final plan and say hey here's what you have figure out the best way to we, use it. I'm just not sure which, we have met with them three times to date and um at each time we've incorporated all of the recommendations within the, within the plans so we have not heard any um questions about evacuation plans or access to the site. They, they've seen the plans and, and appear to be happy with them. And then I guess like, even like the, you know, thinking about fire drills and thinking just about, you know, from my own experience, how far away from a building, you know, you would go away in a fire drill. Is there even that much space on that site to get, you know, far enough from the fire drill to be the, the appropriate distance away from a, a building that's, you know, under, uh, duress it was not brought up as a concern so we can ask uh, chief smith again but it, it wasn't something that he brought to our attention so that was pretty much what i was sort of getting at is if for some reason there's not access to the front due to an emergency like a fire is there some place for people to go because it is right. for 400 kids have to go to the playground in the back what are they even safe back there if there's an emergency in the building Exactly. Yeah, these points are all, all very well taken. Our other emergency management plans, including West Parish, have been done in conjunction with the police department. And I think that as things are now taking shape, it's probably a, a very good idea that we have further conversations with them so they can assist in our making decisions about the proper course of action, if there's an evacuation or something along those lines. Any other questions? Laura? Just one more thing, and I'm sure it's way too soon in our world process of this, but is there any, in architecture circles or school building circles, uh, obviously the, the pandemic where, that we're in the midst of may lead to new ways of uh, congregating in the future. I know you're far along in the process of designing this school, I'm just wondering if there's been any early, like preliminary, like, oh, we're gonna have to do X differently as we think about the future um, with global pandemics here in the United States. So again, I know it's very soon, this school is far along in the process, but I'm wondering if there's been any um, conversation in, in architectural circles about what, what that's gonna look like uh, in the next year. I, I think we've all come to understand the importance of technology 
and uh, making sure that students have technology available to them in classrooms so that they can learn. Um, I think the schools that have been successfully teaching online have students that have had exposure to technology uh, within their classrooms. So I think that's one of the important things that we're going to continue to see moving forward. Um, architecturally, I don't know if things are going to change a lot um, due to this. Uh, you know, we, we work very hard for air infiltration systems and, and making sure that there's always clean air. Uh, a few years back, they, they actually did change the amount of air, fresh air that, that you see going through a building. That's why teachers are often complaining that they're cold. It's because the fresh air uh, intake is 100% uh, fresh air um, more often than it used to be in, in the past. I don't know what else might be coming from this. I'm, I'm anxious to see, but I, I do know that technology has been one of those things that we've talked about quite a bit. Okay, thank you. Kathy? Um, just one last question. So um, it sounds like the concerns that were just brought up about kind of the evacuation and things like that. Um, I assume you'll have a meeting again with the safety heads, the chiefs, um, is it, are we too far down a path to make um, significant changes in that area or, um, or is this more of a discussion to confirm what the process actually would be um, given that the fire chief and the police chief have been in, you know, three meetings with you and talked about what they needed for access and what, um, you know, what all their codes are and everything else. So um, I'm just wondering if you expect anything except clarification coming out of those discussions. I'm not expecting anything to change drastically. Uh, whatever recommendations that they have, we would certainly incorporate uh, within our plans. But um, given that we've had some contacts with them and that they've seen these plans and that we've incorporated um, all of their recommendations, I, I don't expect to hear any more. But uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, we will certainly be meeting with them again. And, you know, again, we're only at schematic design. So uh, through, uh, from now until the end of the process, if we have the opportunity to continue, that would be um, something that we'd certainly be meeting with them more often about. Yeah. And, and just one last comment because of our discussion with Mike Hale, um, you know, and in our building committee meetings, I know we have discussions and we ask questions about maintenance and costs, but mm -hmm. um, it's becoming very clear that the least amount of um, kind of labor intensive maintenance, um, I, Mike Hale pointed out certain things as it relates to the sophistication of, of some of their maintenance, right. which he said, you know, things are moving that way. So I don't think that was the issue. It, it's more, um, if we're picking finishes, let's make sure we pick them that have, you know, lower labor intensive um, requirements than others. So, um, so we just need to be mindful as we move forward in, in selections. Right. We also do, I mean, uh, because we're uh, going for a LEED certified building, um, like West Parish was LEED gold. I think you actually got to gold. Uh, you know, there are certain maintenance things that are required for those kinds of maintaining those kinds of certifications as well. Um, things like flooring, uh, those kinds of solutions that you use, the kind of materials that we use within the building, um, all of that plays into uh, the longevity of the building, as well as its ability to you know, be environmentally friendly. Melissa? Um, two questions. One, um, how, how tall is the fence going around the back that we're worried about in the back? How high is it? I don't know right at the moment. I could, I could find out for you. I mean, is it something that the kids could easily get over or is it something that's gonna be really high so that the kids can never get over? It's actually, it's a requirement because you don't want the children, there are what they call runners um, and yep. you don't want them leaving the sites. So I believe at West Parish, we were asked to do a fence that was six foot high. So I think that's what we have in our- um, And is it typical that you put put like gates and those type of fences? Uh, you know, we, will, like chain we will if we're asked to, it's not yeah. typical. Okay. And my second question is, um, what are we doing that's green related to the school that we would see in the design? Uh, lots. Um, so we're actually, we're trying to achieve uh, 
lead, lead V4 silver. So the requirements of uh, lead have progressed considerably since our last school with this district. It is now harder to get to silver, let alone gold, than it was back when we did this parish. So we are trying to um, achieve a lead V4 silver for this building. Uh, and in doing so, we'll be talking about the HVAC system. Uh, at tomorrow's meeting, we looked at all of the finishes and materials for the building. We're looking at uh, the turf field as one because you don't need the irrigation. We're looking at the kinds of uh, building structure that we put in place, the amount of thermal insulation that we have in place. It really, it starts from, from the ground and goes straight up. Um, I can share the lead. Uh, card with you if, if you would like. It's a score. I'd like to see it. Is, yeah. Is there an intention to do like any gray water or geothermal anything? Uh, we're not. Do, well, at this moment, we're not doing the geothermal. We we could. Um, we're at the point where we could make that change if we wanted to, but that's not. It wasn't what we were. The direction that we're going in. We will have okay. a. We will be PV ready on the roof so that you could put 50% of the roof could be uh, solar panels if that's the direction you want to go in. And then that's a requirement um, by the MSBA to have PV ready roof. Okay. Yeah, I'd love uh, to get a copy of that list. The, the lead scorecard with you uh, yep. in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Samantha, did you have a question? I'm just curious, does the reimbursement change depending on what level lead certified we are? Uh, there's a two percent, uh, two percentage points that you get for being more energy efficient, uh, more energy efficient. It used to be based on uh, cheap lead silver uh, to get those two percentage points, but now it's just being twenty percent higher than your um, baseline for your energy efficiency, which we will achieve. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Michelle. I'd, I'd like to thank you. And uh, um, you uh, have done a great job um, presenting um, the design to this point. And I just, um, it's easy to um, find out, uh, you know, um, what might be wrong with everything. But I'd like to just add in uh, that this is really a great project. And it, this we will be so lucky if we can get um, this built. Uh, the, and the students of Gloucester will be so lucky if we can get this built. Um, we heard tonight from Mike Hale about the life expectancy of um, the modulus in our buildings. And, um, uh, you know, we um, really, truly need this new school. So um, thank you for all the work you've done. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you for your time. Okay, so, uh, next order, order of business is we're going to take up, um, we, we touched on this at our last meeting, but the, um, the uh, commissioner or, uh, has allowed us to use uh, four days next week um, as school days, um, and uh, we need to vote to do that. Um, uh, Rich, you want to uh, elaborate? Yes, uh, the, the preliminary recommendations are that um, because of the school closure, all districts were required to go the requisite 185 days, the 180 plus the five snow days. Uh, he has since uh, said that uh, the April vacation is a local decision, and, but that using the four days would then reduce uh, the number from the 85 down to the 181. Uh, he, uh, based on yesterday's phone call, he has been getting some um, questions about, well, if we used a couple of days prior to the closing, is that going to impact it? He said, I'll have some further guidance. But right now, my understanding is, is that we use the four days. It brings us down to 181. Then there's the day before school and um, the election day professional development. That's the contractual 183 that we would be paying teachers for. So um, administration's recommendation is that we go forward. And the union did a survey as well, and the vote was somewhere around 85% to 15% ballpark in favor of uh, maintaining a sense of continuity of learning through uh, what right now is the April vacation. Uh, 
like not. Any questions uh, anybody would like to ask before we make a motion and uh, and uh, have a discussion? Kathy? Uh, what would the last day of school be if this passes? I think it's June 17th. We were scheduled for the 23rd, work your way backward, I think it's the 17th. Any other questions? Okay, then we need a motion. Um, I'll make a motion that we continue education um, through the April vacation week for the four days. Second. Okay. Discussion. Yeah, goes better. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, hold on. Joel? Um, hold on. Yeah, Mayor, you're going to mute it. Yeah, I did. We can hear you. Um, I know. That's okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to vote against this and I'm just going to kind of explain my reasoning. The first is that to my knowledge, we've not received any information that we are not returning to school this year, in which case I would rather four six hour days in person in June than four three hour Zoom days in April. I fully agree that it's a shame to get started on some normalcy in a schedule and then take a pause for a week and expect them to have to get restarted again. However, I'm incredibly disappointed that during our negotiations about um, how we're gonna move forward as a district with the teachers, we did not address the fact that the goal here is to provide education to our students and try and make up for the time we lost, we'll never recover all the time we lost, but that we didn't work in a way to work through a vacation and still go out as far as we can to try and help these students be as progressed as possible by the time next year starts. Uh, like it was a total missed opportunity. And I, you know, so I'm stuck between choosing four three hour Zoom days or four six hour in person days. Even with the disruption in April, I think you have to go with the four six hour in person days. Now, again, if I'm incorrect and there's been guidance I haven't been told from Desi or the governor's office that we are not going back and those June days will also be via Zoom then you know i'm less I'm less hesitant to vote for this but right now if we're going back to school we should have these children as many days as we can in front of actual teachers not on melissa um i just want to say that i am going to support this motion wholeheartedly and i i want to make this loud and clear because i didn't get to say it in the beginning when everyone else did i am extremely impressed with the fact that the, the gta um, and the 85%, if not more, is on board with this. I think it's very, very important that we keep the momentum. I mean, I do have my granddaughter in my life every day and talk to her about it today. And she's finally on her schedule and she's enjoying it and looking forward to getting up in the morning. And from, from a perspective where um, she's a child that needs consistency, I just think it is um, very, very important to keep the what what education is happening to keep it going. I think if we stop in the middle, um, it could be a lapse for many students and I'm not willing to take that chance, especially where the teachers are on board to make this happen. So um, I wholeheartedly am gonna support it. I know we've got an email from parents that are, have asked us to support this. Um, so that is my position and I feel very strongly about it because um, we're getting guidance from the Board of Education on a daily basis. I'm not too worried about going back to school. I mean, I work for the state and we're being told um, we're not going to go back till July or August. So who knows what's going to happen? I'm not going to make a decision tonight based on something that could not happen and support this motion going forward. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Rich, you uh, have some information? Well, no, I have some. Um, Good speculation. Uh, the commissioner in his um, phone conference yesterday, when asked the question, uh, quote, probably unlikely that we're going back in May and that he would provide as quick a heads up as he possibly can. And he expects a decision from the governor by at the latest early next week. Laura? Um, I just want to understand Joel's position. Um, so Joel, is, are, is what you're saying that if we were to go back to school, you'd rather have those 
four days in the classroom in June if we're there. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, we, we can't go back and un undo the mistake of not trying to get the four on the floor front and back. So okay. that would be picking a certain four days. I'd rather four six hour days with a person. Than okay. Four, three okay. Days I'm just I just wanted to understand because I as a parent whose child has only had two days of this so far, and we are five weeks into this. Um, I wholeheartedly support this because we're not even on a schedule yet. Um, and to sort of stop and start and stop and start is, you know, on the possibility that we'll get these extra days in June. Um, it just, it's, it's a non-starter for, for me as a parent and as a school committee member. So I'm very supportive of this measure. Kathy? Um, I also am going to support this motion. I think that um, so many people were so excited to actually begin real learning again when we started the remote. Um, the connection is important, the, the connection both with teachers and with friends. I've heard from many parents who have said their kids are thriving on a, more of a schedule and to interrupt that learning now would be more harmful than it would be good. No one has mentioned to me any comment about whether we'll be getting done early or not. They just did not want the vacation to happen because they felt the kids have been on vacation, you know, for at least three of the weeks in terms of their academic learning. So um, I think it's important both for the students to continue some real learning as well as the teachers to continue refining how they're reaching kids and, and how they're approaching providing that instruction to our kids. And it would be detrimental, I think, to both of them to interrupt that. Is there any uh, more discussion? Okay, Maria, can we get a roll call vote? Mr. Favaza. No. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Yeah. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yeah. Ms. Reason. Yes. And Kathy Clancy. Yes. It carries uh, six to one, um, and we will be uh, having school next week. Um, superintendent's report, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got the superintendent's report. There may be a couple of other items that you don't have from the commissioner's call yesterday. Um, and I have sent you a uh, copy of the positive happenings, uh, which I hope to send out tomorrow. And uh, if Greg has had a chance, um, he may be able to provide us with some anecdotal information about things going in and around the district. And certainly we can invite the principals back at uh, next week's school committee meeting. Uh, item number one, uh, I had sent out last, uh, a few days back, I don't recall anymore, um, some information about uh, where uh, folks can go in order to get the latest information regarding COVID-19, emergency management, and any information that they like. Uh, I'd like to send out uh, something uh, tomorrow as well, which deals more with the social emotional piece. So there's some information here from MEMA, from the Massachusetts Emergency Management System, uh, where folks can call, uh, they can call in English, they can call in Spanish. And uh, there are some items here for emotional health assistance, uh, specifically if you dial 211, uh, listen to the options, and there's a call to talk, which is option, they say to press 25. The Samaritans is continuing their operations 24-7, uh, and uh, there's some uh, a hotline uh, phone number there as well. There's something called the Disaster Distress Helpline um, that can provide some crisis uh, counseling uh, for folks in emotional distress. And what you don't have on your, on your report is that um, if, there's, um, if there are concerns about sexual or domestic violence taking place in the home, uh, there's a, an agency called SafeLink, uh, and they have a hotline at 877-785-2020 and a website as well. So I'll be uh, sending that out. I know at the last governor's briefing, uh, Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito spoke a lot about concerns regarding the domestic violence. So I'd like to get that information out as quickly as possible. Uh, item number two, um, I just saw this in my emails and sent it to you, uh, particularly because uh, it's a video about um, teachers at high school, at the high school, missing their students and the like. It's very nice. 
But I also wanted to have a shout out for a GHS student, Martina Gallo, who compiled all the information, the materials, and she was able to edit it and put it together. So um, I thank her for her efforts. And uh, there are other schools that are having drive-by parades and doing other videos and like, but uh, again, I wanted to um, provide some recognition for Martina. Uh, item number three, some legislation uh, regarding uh, MCAS, the student opportunity uh, plans. Uh, regional school district budgets don't uh, apply to us. Um, it was on April 10th, as you know, that Governor Baker signed legislation addresses uh, related to the COVID-19 state of emergency, um, which means uh, a couple of things for us. Number one, the uh, MCAS testing is canceled for this year. Uh, there was a question yesterday as why it took so long for the decision to be made and uh, bureaucracy moves fairly slowly but the state had to get a waiver from the federal government and then the state had to pass legislation giving the authority to the commissioner uh, he in turn once granted that authority has waived uh, the mcas requirement uh, for the rest of this year there is the issue of the competency determination for high school graduation which could impact on seniors those who, who have taken retests and they've taken their latest retests in uh, late February and early March, results should be coming out. Uh, any further guidance regarding that particular issue, um, according to the commissioner, will be forthcoming. The, um, the, the next piece is the Student Opportunity Act and um, you have already voted and approved prior to the original April, for, April 1st deadline, our three-year strategic plan. The, governor, the commissioner has um, move that timeline to May 15th, uh, and he may be extending it even further, uh, be that as it may, uh, we've got ours done. Melissa had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. We can't hear you. We're not hearing you, Melissa. She's muted. You're muted. Your phone is muted. I was muted and I lost the meeting, so I had to find it. So sorry, okay. thank you. Um, I was trying to get your attention when you were talking about the graduation assessment. So it's my understanding you said the students took their test in February and March um, and they get the results soon. Is there anything that usually happened after they got the results that would give them another chance? Or has the testing been done accordingly and even though we're um, in the situation we're in, it wouldn't matter. So this is exactly what the uh, Department of Education is working on, that um, he, he stated that the retest was taken in February and early March in the hopes right. that that's gonna minimize the number of students that might be at risk. And they'll be providing us with more information. Uh, they are, uh, they're anticipating, as, as they usually do for students in those situations, that there will be an August graduation. There may be an August graduation for everybody, oh, okay. but the kids with a competency determination, uh, it's a question of, can they put another retest together? Can it be manufactured and produced by the companies? Uh, how will it be administered remotely? There's all sorts of things that they're working on uh, to try to figure that out, or ultimately, will he grant a waiver? Uh, it's also competency determination has to do with local um, grades as well and how the, uh, you know, a particular child is performing. So as soon as I get some more information about that, I'll, I'll be sharing it with you. Thank you. Samantha, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, it was about specific to the domestic violence resources. And Safafia, um, chime in to, do you think it would be helpful to have local resources listed as well as having safe link absolutely okay i was talking to the essex um status commission for women last night on a um before the city council meeting because i'm on that represent essex county and the biggest concerns of some of the people there of domestic violence defendant domestic violence some of the attorneys who chimed in and hawk is that um unfortunately most of our um abuse relationships are stuck in a household they can't go to their only person who's surviving they can't go to their mothers or anywhere else and when they asked how's everything going at home you have the abuser right there and at least sometimes they had a little break if the abuser went to uh to work now they're all stuck home and the only ones who really noticed the children 
um, where the teachers or you know the early intervention people or the therapist would know that a child now a child's stuck in a home how do we handle how do we do that and honestly we're all like in arms like how do we you know how does a teacher can def I don't know but to have someone locally we do have people locally to have someone locally to actually say you can call so maybe they might have you know a minute to call or I don't know I really don't know that's really kind of um I think that was like on the back burner on a lot when we were thinking about this um I don't think no one ever thought the schools would be closed more than two weeks that's the whole thing mm -hmm. and and now that it keeps continue it's it's getting more scarier yeah so um Rich just from my own experience working with clients, there's definitely um, the chance that people are going to hit roadblocks calling just one number. So um, there's a couple different numbers, including Hawk locally. Right. Um, and then there's the National Domestic Violence Hotline as well. Um, I've gotten busy signals trying to call. So I think the more the more resources, the better to give people options. Um, yeah, very, very good. Very good point. Thank you. Yep. Um, the better. So yeah, we'll do it. We'll right, do thank it. you. Good. Uh, I would, I, oops. I would just like to uh, um, point something out. I mean, that there's, there's indications that there's an increase of, of domestic abuse, but um, our teachers and, and school nurses are, are some of the primary reporters of child abuse. And with them out of the picture, um, I don't know um, how, uh, you know, what we can do um, to, to um, try to, because kids aren't going to call up and report it, you know. Um, uh, so what do we know about that situation? Well, what I can speak to is we have uh, lots of social service folks and, um, and our special education staff and, and the like that are reaching out uh, to families, to the, to the children on a weekly basis. Um, I ask you to take a look at the positive happenings that I sent out this afternoon to you, which I want to send out uh, tomorrow. But there's a, a, you know, a, a attempts at a lot of uh, communication in that particular regard. I'm, I'm getting only very, very few reports uh, that there are children that they're not able to get into contact with. And uh, one of the questions I've been asked is whether or not we can use um, our SROs and the cops and kids for some outreach uh, as well. And that's uh, something I want to take up with uh, Chief Connolly and I'm going to be doing so. Um, but again, um, it's my understanding that many of our staff are trying to reach out to the kids and I don't know the extent to which children who may be vulnerable um, are able to relate and communicate uh, their, their situation or not. That's a very gray area. Samantha? And last week, I asked sort of a similar question and it sounded like everybody's sort of aware and prepared to do well child checks if necessary, right? So if somebody is concerned um, about the well-being of a kid based on whether or not they don't participate or how they present in a Zoom meeting, um, you know, the teachers do know that they would, they can ask somebody to do a well child check, right? That's, a, that's part yes. of the protocol. Okay. Yes. Um, I know it's, there's like so many gray areas with this because we're virtual, um, but you know I think it's just helpful to know that everybody um, has the same protocol in regards to it. Mm -hmm. Melissa? Um, we're in the age of see something, say something, and I'm wondering if it would be helpful um, if either Rich or you, um, Chairman Pope, write a letter to the editor or to the newspaper, or I, I think we may even have the Boston Daily Times listening now, but maybe bringing it to the attention of the community um, of the struggles that come with domestic violence and things like that. And maybe it will just raise awareness to the community so that we're all looking out for each other and things like that with a number that they can report it. Because obviously our mandated reporters aren't, don't get the opportunity to see the child or the family so much right now so maybe just bringing this issue to head for the whole community to see as an extra set of eyes right well again those items number one plus more local information will go out to the uh, families in the school department and it uh, doesn't take a, much of a stretch to take that information and send it over with a, a cover letter to the uh, newspapers as well 
Uh, item number four, just some legal advisories, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, some of the things that uh, we've been taking into account as we move forward with the whole remote learning uh, process. Um, on teachers recording live lessons for the purpose of sharing it with students who are absent, um, they can record uh, remote lessons provided that proper notice is given to parents and students ahead of time. And uh, you'll hear this a couple of three times, but we've done that uh, with the disclaimer slash acknowledgement of what we can and cannot do with respect to confidentiality and also what the expectations are from students and parents. For example, they cannot reproduce or transmit uh, any of the information that they're getting uh, from a third party. So we have done legally uh, what we are required to do. Um, recording um, in the remote instruction is no violation of the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act uh, unless you are disclosing something which is personally identifiable, uh, identifiable about a particular child and if it's part of a student record. So just having uh, kids um, on the video, um, the legal recommendation is to extend possible, it should really only be the instructor and the material, but there is no violation of the child's rights or their records if they are shown. Uh, where it can become part of a, a record is if the recording's used for disciplinary action or it shows a student in uh, violation of local, state, or federal law, uh, or if it shows that there happens to be something, uh, some assault of behavior going on um, that's, those are the kinds of things that uh, would uh, drift into the FERPA uh, protections and stuff. So uh, if something like that should happen, uh, teachers will know that they need to report that to us and we'll take the necessary security measures to ensure that we're not, uh, we'll do our best to make sure that we're not violating uh, individual uh, students' rights. Uh, regarding concerns about parents possibly or expectedly observing instruction and uh, service delivery, again, um, there's nothing wrong with a parent inadvertently observing a lesson, provided that they understand that there is a disclaimer and a consent to participate, uh, which makes very clear to the parent and the child that uh, there is to be no third party access. And we have already sent out that information uh, to all families. Um, since we're doing things remotely, uh, this not only includes the academic piece, but also teletherapy and some special education um, modifications and accommodations and, and, the, and the like. Uh, what's relevant here is that a number of our uh, specialists in speech and language pathology, audiologists, physical therapy, o OT, occupational therapy, there is a um, a requirement of 10 hours of training if they're going to do what's called telepractice policy. The state has temporarily waived that so that we can go full speed ahead uh, with the consultations that are necessary. And the practitioner has to get that, um, that required 10 hours in uh, sometime within the next uh, four months, I believe. So we're good to go, uh, but they'll have to get that training later, uh, but they can do so because of the waiver. Uh, the same is true for um, the other services. Um, we mentioned, can districts do a lunch bunch? The answer is yes, but apparently we're not going to be doing that. Um, on paraprofessionals providing support or one-to-one -one service, as long as the format is workable for the paraprofessional and the student, and uh, we'll try to be accommodating that with the um, a memorandum of understanding that we would like to put forward, uh, with uh, our education support professionals, uh, but the uh, paraprofessionals by regulation, they can phone, they can video conference, they can email, depending upon the particular needs of the student, and we will try to remain very consistent with that. The other important piece is that they have to, like the teachers, we have to document and chronicle the work that's being done, because once we are back in school, the um, depending upon the extent of services we can provide that will determine what we might have to do that's compensatory as well so obviously it's very important to keep records um, as far as the um, english language learners it's very important that we continue to facilitate their learning we had a meeting about this last week and it's not enough for the el children to be sitting in regular classes, virtual or otherwise. We are also working out the schedule so that they're getting direct 
instruction as well. At the high school, definitely, and I believe at the middle school as well, there are specific classes for them. And at the elementaries, they're looking at that more flex type schedule and trying to figure out exactly uh, where the children uh, will be able to be placed so they can get direct contact um, with their English language learner teachers. So that is the, um, that's the superintendent's report that you have. I would just like to add a couple of uh, items as well. This is um, from the report yesterday from the commissioners. Apparently September 14th uh, is going to be Patriots Day, again, Redux, and the Boston Marathon. Um, this Monday remains a holiday there is still in the works as to whether or not the September 14th is going to become an official state holiday as well. If it is, then we're, you, you guys are probably going to have to look at the calendar um, and make some changes, but you'll know that before the end of this uh, school year. I mentioned before that the governor is expected to make a decision by early next week or before on uh, whether or not to extend uh, the school closures beyond the May 4th. Uh, there was some stuff about student registration. Uh, we have been working um, on creating a system for student registration, including a newly generated form created by uh, Mr. Bach, where um, parents can go online and it's a PDF that you could actually type into and they can do the form online. And we've also created procedures whereby they can either scan and send um, the other uh, supplemental materials or we can work out a social distance uh, um, uh, drop-off kind of situation, but uh, we've been working on that. Another issue we've been talking about is the screening of English uh, language learners. Uh, the Department of Ed has sent out some, uh, some guidance on provisional identification and how to screen individuals and to do your best um, remotely. It's referred to as provisional screening. Uh, we're aware of this and we're working on that as well. A report, and I did receive an email uh, late this afternoon from MASS, Mass Association of School Superintendents. MIT is doing a uh, report of state-by-state -state comparisons with respect to the recommendations coming out of the respective departments of education on remote learning. Uh, Massachusetts, apparently, uh, the advance notice is that they've gotten uh, some good reviews with respect to the advice that we have received, which has been the basis, as you know, for our memorandum of understanding. Uh, but the point that was made by the commissioner, which is a good one, we we're going to have to look back and uh, putting things down on paper is great, but what is the execution? And we can expect some more guidance on that next week. There is a statewide techn technology survey as well. Uh, so far, 191 districts have responded. We need to do the same. But the state wants to know how many children don't have access, how many are sharing computers with other families, how many families have one computer, but two, three, four, five kids in the home? Uh, the purpose of this is to gather that data, but the, the uh, department apparently is working with uh, corporations, both the telecommunications and with the powerhouses like Dell and HP and all the rest to see if they can find ways to provide more access for children with respect to technology. Um, relatively speaking, we're in pretty good shape. Historically, the Western part of the state has always been in rather dire shape when it comes to having um, you know, full, um, uh, full internet systems. Uh, as we know, the budget for FY21 is under serious pressure. Um, the, the ranges of revenue losses at the state level vary anywhere from two and six to six billion dollars. Um, they need, they being the state, need to go right back to the drawing board. Uh, what uh, we were told uh, by the CFO from the Department of Ed is that uh, traditionally the House, I'm sorry, the governor creates a budget, the House does, and then the Senate. Uh, this year, it appears as though the House and the Senate may develop the budget together, um, like a CM at risk, closely with the uh, governor. Timing is still questionable as to whether or not they're going to have a budget by July the 1st. Quote, too many factors, revenues must be assist, very difficult to put a final budget uh, together uh, at this particular point in time. Um, our local situation is one thing, uh, what we're hearing from the state um, actually appears to be potentially a little bit more tumultuous. We don't, uh, they, the, the fellow said that they're not even sure that the Student Opportunity Act money 
$229,000 on top of the Chapter 70 coming to us right now is not an absolute lock. It's not a guarantee. In terms of the uh, federal uh, waiting for some guidance, the, that $2 trillion, uh, dollar, uh, the CARES Act, about $215 million's worth is being appropriated uh, to the state of Massachusetts and will be distributed probably along Title I guidelines, which is based, as you know, upon percentages of uh, low income. Uh, so we're going to wait and see what happens there. I mentioned the MCAS. We talked about uh, April vacation. If school closing is extended, uh, they will be, um, they, the state uh, Department of Education will be providing further guidance around, quote, power standards. Um, and the question has come up as to whether or not uh, teachers should be moving forward with new curriculum and instruction. Um, the, the response there uh, is that they will provide us with more uh, guidance on that uh, at another time, but it's something that people are at least thinking about. Um, it's, it's very tough to really know how to think about that right now as we're getting our scheduling off the ground. Um, teacher evaluation. This is um, best left to local districts based upon uh, different uh, contracts. Uh, there are a couple of recommendations. I think I sent you a document from Mike Long, legal counsel for the Mass Association of uh, School Committees, and a um, couple of suggestions. Look to the last formal assessment, either formative or summative, and use that as the basis to carry through for this year, or simply pause and recommence next year with each teacher being in the, uh, with the same status. Right now, our MOU through school closure with the teachers is that the evaluation would be extended the same amount of time as school has been closed. But if school closes for the rest of the year, where does that put us? The, uh, probably the easiest option would be to pause and then to begin again next year where teachers carry over uh, their status from one year to the next. And quite frankly, the same holds true for um, somebody who's a first year teacher this year. We don't have a baseline for them, but we'd really have to just begin next year and uh, do our evaluations uh, with, you know, with the requisite scrutiny. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, somebody asked whether or not uh, MCAS 2021 was going to be canceled. And um, the answer was at this time, no. Uh, a firm no, but you know nobody knows how long and how extensive uh, our current situation is going to be. Okay. okay. Next, and um, I have mentioned to you that the positive happenings uh, school closure update uh, is in your hands, and I hope to send it out uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, but it's um, it gives. Uh, it, it gives families a little bit of a sense of an overview of what they're experiencing and hopefully provides you with a bit of an explanation as a follow-up to last week's uh, dialogue with the principals and in anticipation of next week's conversation with them as well. Um, the first um, uh, video is on the Facebook on the website. Uh, Greg and I spent a half an hour or so talking about the situation and we put that out there and uh, we'll try to be doing one each Friday and getting those up as well. And um, Greg, is there anything that you wanted to add? Um, I wouldn't mind adding just a little bit of insight, insight into uh, what the teachers are up to, if that's okay. Uh, it's one of the uh, very positive parts of my day today uh, was um, seeing the number of teachers who came by the main office um, to pick up a Chromebook to take it to a student or a family who had um, in conversation, you know, through instruction had uh, let them know that they were sharing. And this comes back to uh, our technology coverage in our, in our city as well, um, that uh, had communicated that it was challenging because they were sharing with a brother or sister or two brothers or sisters and the the, the teachers reached out to me and in in some cases drove up and picked up a, a computer to deliver to the home so we've been responding to um 
any request for um, where there's a need in a, in a family that has multiple siblings, um, you know, we're taking care of that. So that, that was a, a really nice thing to see and that's been happening the last few days. And then this afternoon I had a, a I was in on a Zoom call with a, a, a you know, dozen teachers who were looking into <clears throat> piloting uh, you know, a revised math curriculum for next year. They were intently, and this was uh, teachers talking to teachers, and I've been around long enough that I'm kind of part of the furniture. So they, they're just, you know, they're, they're uh, talking to each other about the challenges, about goals, about things they're doing, and, and uh, they are actively uh, uh, working on and thinking about um, revisions they need to make for now, to take into account the the lack of coverage, uh, work that might need to happen in uh, in the fall, as well as piloting uh, adjustments uh, for next year. So they're they're right in the midst of uh, all of this instruction, and they're already looking at the impact uh, of next year and beginning to plan for that. Um, and I do just want to share that. Um, you know, this is a group of teachers who uh, I've known for a long time and, and they just do not exaggerate at all. And uh, at the end of the call, they were, you know, proud and happy about what they are doing and sharing. But they also said that their days are, um, you know, in, in many cases, 12 to 15 hours, because one of the things we all, we don't realize is that each of those interactions with the students can sometimes generate, um, you know, 15 or 20 emails uh, afternoon and evening and morning, because once a, you know, it's, it's, it's much more challenging to be able to connect and communicate um, content and understanding um, to the students. And they, they have individual needs and questions and they're reaching out to the teachers all hours of the day. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of communication that's going back and forth, a lot of support um, and I just uh, have a tremendous amount of respect for what they're doing. And I know that that's happening in schools, all schools across the district. So, um, you know, along with the positive happenings that we saw, the, the kind of feel good things, I think one of the positive takeaways is that we have a lot of teachers working really hard to um, maintain uh, individual support and connections with, uh, with lots of families and students. Samantha? Thank you, Greg, for that. Um, I'm just curious, are, are there conversations with teachers on, or just support for teachers on how to create boundaries around sort of this new frontier of um, endless communication? Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, teachers are feeling comfortable setting boundaries at some point, um, because I, it's, Although it's really nice, and I'm sure people really appreciate that people are putting in 15 days. I'm sure a lot of these people have families. Um, and I think at some point, that's really unrealistic. Um, and I just want to make sure that teachers are feeling supported. Um, it, it, is, uh, I, I, it is unrealistic. Um, it is um, early and it's new, which is why I think they're really front loading a lot of, a lot of time. Um, and they did talk about that. I've t we've talked about that. That has come up in a number of cases. Um, and it's certainly something that I know that the um, principals will be talking about during staff meetings. Um, teachers are doing a lot of sharing during common planning time, during, um, you know, afternoon meetings, staff meetings. And um, I, I do feel that the, the, I, a good balance will be found, but I just want to acknowledge that right now, in the newness of all of this, they're they're working really hard to do this, and the the students and their families need it, and the teachers are providing it. So my my hats off to them. And yes, we will make sure that they understand that um, that we recognize that they have uh, they have very full lives as well, and that they feel supported. That when there's nobody who is expecting. To do this, it's uh, it's an understanding that they are responding to a need, and and um, hopefully it will normalize. 
And I um, I'm, guess I'm more wondering if at some point from the administration it would be helpful to just um, send a message to parents that, you know, teachers might not get back to them right away. And I think we're just so accustomed to um, having communication at our fingertips and expecting people to get back to each other right away. Um, and I, I do feel like it might be helpful for um, somebody to set a, a clear message that it might not happen that day, that maybe the next day, um, just so that people aren't putting in 15 hours. Yeah, and I, I have to say, I, I said that because um, I wanted to acknowledge the kind of hard work. Um, and I, you know, I, we all hope that that is not a norm and that that doesn't continue. And I trust our administrators and our staff uh, to, to communicate and share that message. And uh, we'll make sure we do the same from the central office. Thank you. Um, I know um, Rich and Greg, you both mentioned a little bit about um, both the Department of Ed guidelines and what what advice they're giving. Um, as it and and Greg, you mentioned next planning to how how we make it up kind of next year. Um, and speaking from somebody who has a high school sophomore, there's certain content that is going to show up on a SAT or an ACT test that isn't just how well can he write, but is he being tested on material that maybe he won't get to. So um, as, and I realize right now we're dealing with the here and now, but um, I'm hoping we're thinking about what, what remedial or extra um, tutoring might happen next school year for some of these con real content related um, material that kids need to know that they can't, they can't get away with not knowing, you know? So just a comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, just very much on everyone's minds. Yeah, thank you. Laura? Thank you, and um, to Rich and Greg and all the teachers, you know, thank you for everything you're doing in this really chaotic and crazy moment. Um, I have a few questions um, related to my experience with elementary, and I just um, wanted to get a sense of this. And we also, um, some school committee members received a, a, a letter from a parent also asking about consistency um, through the elementary schools. Um, it's pretty clear that every elementary school is on a different, in, in a, working in a very different way. Um, and I'm wondering if we're having principals share best practices, if there's anything, because I'm, um, I'm told that one elementary school parents are leading Zoom meetings every morning so the kids can get together, um, at least in one grade. Um, Rich, you had sent out um, a group call coming from West Parish, which was to the, all the students. Um, uh, I can only speak to our school from a parent's perspective, but basically what's happening at every school is different. It also started at different times. Um, the way it's happening is different. And I'm wondering if there's any interest in or effort towards, or if there's any benefit to being more consistent across the schools. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I would, you know, working in a standards-based environment, um, my immediate answer is yes seeing this is like the wild west and putting things into place it's almost like venture capitalism what are schools what are individual teachers what are groups of teachers coming up with it's been since last wednesday and um, we need to have the dust settle and we need to talk with the principals and say well what is working and how it is not to suggest that prior to school closure that they didn't have their own distinct ways of doing things either so this could be an extension and a manifestation of the same. But your point is very well taken. How do we strike a balance between ensuring that initiative and creativity has a chance to flourish? And at the same time, how do we ensure that the best practices themselves are being distributed equally across uh, all of the schools? 
So um, the point that you're making is that there are discrepancies and that, and that there's a concern about that. And that's something that we will take up with the principals uh, at our next meeting. And I'm, that's not a blame for anyone. I think people have different creative ideas, but you know, some schools didn't start last Wednesday, like ours. So even that, you know, that even that, not every school started last week. Mm -hmm. Some schools started this week. Yeah, yeah. So well, I, um, we can certainly ask why. I don't know if you're aware of that, Greg, as to the why. Uh, no, I'm. I'm not. Uh, I would expect significant differences, especially at this point in in such a dramatic transition. Um, and all I can say is, I know that teachers are working really hard and sharing across the district, but that takes a little bit of time. And yeah, we will definitely talk with together with the principals about major discrepancies. I I think they're going to happen no matter what they do currently. Schools have different characters. Characters, things are handled diff slightly differently from one school to another. That we can do the best we can. There are always going to be differences, but if there are major things that are missing at one, then certainly we can share that. Okay. Well, I'm happy to write you separately on that. And then um, related to that, you know, the differentiation that happens in each classroom, you know, regularly is obviously much much harder to achieve now. Um, and I, again, you just said it, we're waiting for the dust to settle. Um, my, my experience so far with the remote learning is that it's at a very, 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 um, it's at a level that includes the most possible students, um, which leaves some students out. So I'm just wondering, um, and again, I know everybody's working really hard to get this working at all, but I'm wondering when or how or if there's different there's a possibility to have differentiation in the learning now, or if we sort of we should sort of plan that that's not really going to be a, a possibility at this point. When uh, when you say the most possible, could you explain what you mean by that? Um, I can only speak to my personal experience as a first grade parent. Um, and what I'm seeing in some of the work is that's coming home is quite basic, um, so basic as to not be of interest. Um, so, and I understand that there are children who are still learning some of those things, but I've heard from other parents as well, wondering why this work is coming home um, at this level. So I can only imagine that, you know, what, what the teachers have said to me is we want to make sure everyone understands certain concepts, but these concepts seem very, very basic. Um, and I, you know, I, I, again, the teachers know the students better than I do. I don't have a breadth of understanding of every student in a grade. And the, obviously the, the things are, are um, uh, tailored to an entire grade, but it's not just my experience. So that's what I'm, you know, it sort of feels like we're at the, we're sort of starting, we're starting at a very basic level. And I'm just wondering if we can expect there to be differentiation for other students as well. And I can tell you offline, Rich, and other, you know, what more specifically. Yeah. Um, but I just, I just, I know this is very hard and the dust is settling. I just don't know. Um, it's, it took so long to get this up and I get that and I, I know everyone's working, but I just, the differentiation is a tricky bit, bit of business anytime. Um, but I hope that's in the conversation now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple of things. Greg, were you part of the conversation where uh, somebody was talking about uh, offering children and their families three options to the same assignment? I. I'm quite certain that there is differentiation going going on at different ways across the district. Um, I, I I just have to say that I, I saw an email today where there were um, 20 exchanges between the teacher and the student because this past week or so, um, I, I imagine trying to teach a. a a class of first graders and 
trying to get a, over the technological hurdle alone in being able to participate um, in, in any kind of two-way learning to be able to access and navigate the, the materials that are provided. I, I know that a lot of the, the hours that teachers are experiencing right now are around logistics, technology, interactions, um, you know, re rebuilding uh, relationships in this different way, very different way of communicating. That is an enormous undertaking. And, um, you know, it's, it's Wednesday. And um, uh, so I would ask for a little bit of patience on uh, what, as you noted, is really challenging on a, on, on a normal day in a regular classroom differentiation is a is a real challenge in these kinds of conditions um, you know if if it takes a little bit longer to to uh, develop uh, it's it's not a surprise to me um, I'd be happy to um, you know have you send me more specific details and we can look into things if they is if they seem really out of the ballpark but um, you know I think a little bit bit of patience for all the logistics and, and details that are involved with this kind of shift is in order. Um, so. That's Absolutely, point, point well taken, Greg. Thank you. Okay, anything more, Rich? Okay, do we have a motion to accept the superintendent's report? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Got that, Maria? Yeah. <laughs> Get out of the way. Just, just pick one. <laughs> Pick one. Um, uh, roll call vote. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Weeson. Yes. And Kathy Clancy. Yes. So we're going to move on to um, committee reports. And um, first up is the uh, program subcommittee meeting of April 10th. 2020, and uh, Chairman Favaza, would you like to report out? Sure, we got my notes. Um, we discussed three items. The first was trying to combat absenteeism. Um, this is something that was brought to our attention by Greg Bach um, for a number of reasons. One, it's um, good practice, and two, that the uh, turnaround plans that were being provided with, um, all indicate that absenteeism is likely a component to um, the issues that we've been facing in the district. Um, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it 30% of the uh, high school population is absent 18 or more days a year? With the right set of numbers? During this past reporting year, uh, yes, it was 30% for uh, across the board, not a specialized population, but for all students, it was 30%, uh, 18 or more days. Um, and that's, that significantly impacts uh, a student's progress in education. Right. As Dr. Sapphire often points out, it doesn't matter how good the instruction is, if the child's not in the seat to receive it, it's not gonna do them any good. So um, the subcommittee discussed trying to avoid reinventing the wheel. We certainly can't be the first district that's been struggling with this. And so um, the plan forward was to reach out to a consultant. Greg thought that um, there might be some extra money lying around due to funds that are no longer going to be expended as a result of the shutdown. And he's going to work to try and engage um, uh, a consultant to help provide some, um, some, some guidance. And that'll come back to the program subcommittee and then up to the full committee um, when that gets worked out. The second issue we talked about was high school start time. Um, as you know, there's been um, a, a push in various pockets of the state and various pockets of the nation to start high school and middle schools later in the day than they traditionally are um, started currently. We set about trying to figure out the steps we go about to analyze this. So the first step is to compile data both in support and uh, against such a switch. I'm gonna get um, a report of the pros together. Laura has volunteered to do some research, trying to find some cons. After we review the data, we'll decide whether the data favors making a switch. And if we decide that it 
does will review successful implementation processes from other districts that have completed the switch and try and reconcile those procedures and that, that process with the specific challenges of the Gloucester Public School Systems. Um, Principal Cook from the high school was on the meeting and he mentioned that Beverly High School seems to have figured this out. They start a bit later than Gloucester High School does. And then um, third step would be if we're able to determine that we can reconcile how the switch works with our community and that we can pull off the switch, we would make a recommendation up to the school committee to review the work that's been done and see whether the school committee supports moving forward. So if at any of those points we get to a, a no, a negative recommendation will just come up out of the subcommittee. Um, and the third item we uh, touched on was screen time safety and health issues. Um, as you probably know, overuse and or unmonitored use of screens um, you know, by children can lead to various ailments, including physical ailments, social and emotional problems. Um, and we're discussing the potential to help educate parents, especially even getting at preschool, about the importance of limiting and properly monitoring screen time. However, we didn't want to push too hard on that right now because, um, you know, frankly, a lot of parents, uh, including those on the, the subcommittee, admitted that right now a lot are leaning very heavily into screen time as a crutch to get through this quarantine. And we don't want to, you know, accidentally upset or shame any parent who right now is letting their child use a screen more than they otherwise would. But it's something to, sh to begin thinking about so as we go forward into the next school year, if we return to somewhat of a normal society, we can start working on making sure that, especially the children now who are going to, who, you know, we talked about who may have otherwise had a good balance prior to the shutdown, who now have slipped into an out of balance relationship with screen time, would be even more important that when we are able to find viable alternatives that we help parents provide those. And that, I think, was it. Obviously, Sam and Laura, if I've missed anything or miscategorized and characterized anything, feel free to jump in. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we will now, um, we had a building and finance subcommittee meeting just uh, prior to this meeting. Uh, and Chairman Clancy, would you like to uh, report out? Uh, sure. Um, so we went over where we're at in terms of fiscal year 20 and um, we're in good shape uh, within the budget obviously um, with um, room to make a, a sizable prepay for our special education which we do at the end of every year um, and obviously things are being monitored in terms of where there's savings right now versus where we're going to have overages um, there's other things that are going on such as our food service um, is providing a lot of help to the community and to our families. So that's costing us more money than, than is coming in. Um, there's another item we talked about preschool, so there might be less revenue. Um, so there's certain things that are going on the positive side and the negative side. So we're gonna keep an eye on that as it relates to um, the end of this school year. Um, we did have a um, wonderful, um, conversation with Mike Hale from the Department of Public Works. Um, mostly positive and some um, concerning in terms of both, the, you know, mostly our, the condition of our modulars. So we're gonna continue a conversation about that. Um, but I do wanna um, point out some of the positives of what he is doing at O'Malley right now, which I think um, it, it's been somewhat under the radar, but happening behind the scenes. And tonight he gave us a full um, list of all the things that are happening at the middle school while the kids and teachers are not there. Um, one that's very visible is on the outside where they're fixing a lot of the concrete. They have widened some walkways. They've um, created an ADA ramp uh, to get into the school. They have planted trees along the road and created a few handicapped parking spaces in front of the rink. Um, they are painting the sign outside for um, for the school. It's going to be maroon instead of green, which I think that'll really um, kind of, you know, spruce up the place. Um, what else did he talk about? Oh, bathrooms, which I know have been on a list and, and certainly a concern of many parents in the past that sometimes the rooms are locked and there's not enough 
um, privacy for the girls and, uh, you know, it's just has, having to do with patching things for so long that things just tend not to work. And so um, the bathrooms have been updated with new partitions and new fixtures and, hair, and um, hand dryers instead of paper towels. Uh, they've done some painting. They've done some installation of benches around the school. Um, just a real extensive uh, bit of work on our middle school. Um, I know, you know, it could be a never ending list if we think only about aesthetics, but they've been working on all of the interior and things you can't see, such as roofs and HVAC and everything in previous years that make us as school committee members feel that that building is safe and good quality and um, structurally sound. And this particular project, I think, is going to have a real um, boost in terms of morale and aesthetics and pride and um, and function of the school actually on the outside. So I can't thank um, Mike Hale enough for the work that he and his crew are doing at the middle school. Um, we had Anne Marie Jordan um, come to us with a situation with the preschool. Um, Jonathan, do you want to take up this motion tonight, given the timeliness of it? Yes, I think we can. It's coming out of committee and, and it is uh, timely right yeah. now. Yes, so um, the preschool is currently, and anybody can jump in from administration that wants to, but they're currently continuing to provide online, um, online education for students, but as everything else, everything's at a reduced amount of time. So Anne-Marie gave us some information about um, some districts are um, not charging tuition for their preschool kids. Others are charging half um, tuition. Um, others haven't really made a decision. So we have a motion that Maria is actually going to read out because it was a little bit lengthy and I don't want to get it wrong, um, where we are recommending that we um, reduce our tuition for families to half. So Maria, can you read that motion? Please? Sure. So it was after discussion, um, Mr. it was on a motion by Mr. Pope, seconded by Mr. Favaza, to recommend to the full school committee that we reduce the preschool tuition for April, May, and June to 50% of the current monthly charge and let people know that we will consider reducing it to zero if people's situation has been adversely affected due to COVID-19. And I so move. Second. Um, is there any discussion, Laura? Uh, oh. I just have a question. Um, I don't know what, just from a financial perspective, what, um, how big a hit is that to the school budget? The estimate was around 18,000. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, it was also pointed out that they had firsthand um, um, discussions with some families who were laid off because of the, um, the situation and uh, they wouldn't be able to um, pay it, you know, they would have to drop out. And I, I think it's in our, uh, all of our best interest if, if these students continue to um, receive education. Samantha? And it, it was also, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was also reported out that this is pretty much in line with other districts, right? That, that a lot of districts are doing the 50%. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Any further? Is this for what again? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. It's uh, tuition to the preschool for the non uh, special needs students, the, the the model students that we take in, um, I, I'm going to say it's $35 a week, but I may be wrong about that. Um, uh, and um, they, um, so what we talk, they're still providing the services online to the to the preschoolers, but um, oh, they are. So the teachers are they are doing preschool work with them. Yes, they are. Oh, okay. And and they are um, so. Um, but it's not for the same period of time that uh, no. they were going to school for. So the, um, the recommendation out of BNF is to reduce it um, by 50% and to take into consideration if anybody 
uh, family is, is adversely affected by the COVID-19 uh, virus um, uh, that we would consider reducing it to zero. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, roll call vote, Maria. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Gleason. Yes. Ms. Kathy Clancy. Yes. So it passes unanimously. Um, Kathy, you want to go back to? Sure. The um, we also had another. Um, so uh, Kathy Verga joined us to talk about transportation for out of district students and payments to vendors. Um, some of these are our, our four vendors um, would like us to continue paying them. Uh, even though out of district is not being provided, transportation is not being provided. Um, and there is some waiting for guidance, I think, from the state on this particular item, uh, both for tuition and for transportation. So we thought we would just wait to get more information um, between the state and the superintendents as to what people are doing in general as it relates to these particular. Um, relationships with vendors. We want the vendors to be there and be ready to be transporting our kids. On the other hand, um, it's a service we're not actually being provided. So we're trying to come up with what's fair and what is, um, what's advised from state level. So we're going to continue that discussion as more information comes in. Um, and the last item that is a motion has to do, do you want to do the food service tonight or want to wait till the minutes are, um, did that transfer? Well, I, it, I, it's, let me ask Gary, um, Gary, is this uh, time sensitive? Can this wait till next week? Yeah, yes, this can wait. Okay. No problem. All right. Then we'll, we'll put that off, but the, the issue, um, well, you can explain the issue, Kathy. Yeah, the issue is that the um, amount of work that our food service people are, are providing and the benefit they're providing to families in our community, um, you know, it, it can't be quantified in terms of its, how critical it is to supporting people. Um, but it's costing the district more money than it is that we'll be getting reimbursed from the programs that help subsidize these costs. So we need to basically account for that in our financials by um, covering that expense somewhere else. So um, that's what we'll take up next week. Okay, and that's, um, that's my report. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, don't really need to um, do the MSBA um, update other than to say that there will be a building uh, committee meeting tomorrow at five o'clock um, and we're going to go into executive session um, for the purpose of um, discussing um, is it strategy or um, approval um, it's, it's strategy we haven't it's okay, strategy. So yes, strategy. okay for the purpose of discussing uh, uh, strategy for negotiations um, with um, the uh, Gloucester uh, uh, paraprofessionals, um, education support professionals, uh, excuse me. And um, uh, we'll need a motion to go into executive session. We'll come out of executive session only uh, for the purpose of adjourning. Can I just bring up a couple things before we go into executive session? Sure. Um, first of all, who, who's been updating the Gloucester Public Schools website? It looks fabulous. I just wanted to give credit to whoever did some work on it. Um, Very user friendly compared to what it was a couple weeks ago. So I just want to say kudos to whoever did that. <laughs> I believe that would be uh, Mr. Harris doing the Thank you very much. update. Good job. It was very easy to figure out when I got there. Um, second of all, I just want to say um, the article in the newspaper last uh, this morning, I think it was, about um, the St. Peter's Fiesta being given another date in case it doesn't go forward in June. 
seemed to trigger some conversation in the community very early this morning because I woke up to several texts and messages on my phone um, from parents hoping and wondering that we will have a conversation about setting a date for our graduation and the prom if they don't have it. Um, so I just want to put that out there. I know it's been brought up. I know we're committed to doing something in the alternative if we can. Um, but I really think parents are really eager to hear us have a conversation about it. I know now tonight's not the time, but I'm hoping maybe at our next meeting we can start talking about is this going to be a rescheduling or not? Because parents really want to know the answer to this question, especially knowing that if Fiesta has another date, they want to know if their seniors have another date. It's that simple. So I'm just, just hoping at um, the next meeting or by the end of April we have some sort of plan of how we're going to address the fact if they don't go forward. And I know we probably have to wait until the governor announces next week whether we go back to school or not. But um, I just don't want to lose track of that because there are many eager parents waiting to hear from us on that issue. Well, uh, we're meeting again next Wednesday. We can put it on the agenda mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll have uh, more information about um, our future. Um, and before we go into executive session two, I was wondering if Grant could send an invite for executive session to Naomi Stromberg. I see she's on as an attendee um, to this meeting, and um, I had asked her if she could be on standby for our conversation in executive session. But now that I think about it, if Grant has the ability to send her the Zoom information for the executive session meeting, that might be helpful to have her in the room. Yes, I can do that. Um, uh, can someone make sure that I have her email address? Yep. I, I can text that to you. Or I can't text it to you because I'm using my phone. I can email it to you or somebody can. Um, I'll, I'll send it over right now. Thank you. Okay. So um, we're going to still move that motion to go into executive session. Second, anybody? Second. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call, Maria. Discussion. Discussion. Sure. You want? We can have discussion. I'm confused. So I want to sure I understand the procedure here. We're leaving this meeting and going into a different platform to have the executive session. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are we able to just stop broadcasting this meeting? That's what we do in the beginning. These meetings get started. They're not pushed to the public until seven. And then they're pushed public. Can we pull it back and stay right here and then push it back public to adjourn instead of leaving, going to Google, coming back to this one? Grant? Uh, it's, it's, I talked with James about that, and this is actually his recommendation to do that, just to leave this meeting open and running because it's considered a public meeting, go into the other session, then come back. Uh, that was his recommendation, and I'm just I'm sticking to that. So, I mean, I can so, I can, so, so keep this. So don't I, leave this meeting. Just mute this meeting. I am not going to leave this meeting. You all can leave the meeting, but I will stay here to keep it as an active session. Because if I leave, it shuts down. So I have to stay. Keep this meeting open for the duration of your executive session. And then we come back into the same room. Well, then we come back into this session. So there's. So you were sent out a, uh, an invitation that says right on it, executive session. So what you're going to do is, um, depending on how you, you can either leave this meeting and come back to it, or you could uh, just leave it up and open another window and go to the executive session. But you can leave and come back. Um, okay. you, you, when you get to that little um, the, the little Zoom uh, website, uh, it just the little icon you just click on, join the meeting. So um, so that's the way it'll work. And we can, you know, certainly we can look into easier ways of doing it, Joel, um, but this isn't the time. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, we have a motion and a second to go into executive session. Is there any further discussion? Um, seeing none, roll call vote, Maria? Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Taken. Yes. Yeah, I said yes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wheaton. Yes. And Kathy Clancy. Yes. 
Okay, we will adjourn and reconvene in executive session. Uh, see you all there in a couple of minutes. <laughs>